Jackie, I want to start with I want to start with you. Um, for many of us, semiconductors came to epitomize so much of what was broken or remains broken about our supply chain during the during the pandemic. And before we start looking forward to preventing the next one, I want to take a look back and hear from you about what it was like to be on the front lines back in early 2020, maybe even late 19, uh, sorry, 2019, um, when you started to see the early warning signs. Tell us about what went down and how you at Intel responded. Uh, well, I want to start by saying I arrived home from Beijing in um, the end of December 2019 and had the original COVID in January of 2020. Uh, it was quite a shock and no one knew what it was. Just in the same way, we didn't know what was going on in the world. And uh, for our supply chain, because we have a very large installed capital base, we need to continuously feed it so that we can maximize our ability to serve our customers. Um, so as a result, over 40 years or more, we've developed a playbook and some sensing mechanisms to try to see if there are perturbations in the market that could get in the way of uh, delivering production. And uh, in early January, we started to see disruptions to transportation. Um, material wasn't moving and um, we didn't know why. Um, but we didn't need to know why. We started uh, implementing a number of charter um, uh, transport mechanisms so that equipment and materials would get to our factories to provide capacity or to allow us to manufacture parts. Um, and things continued to stay unusual. And so we started to see not just the transportation perturbations, but we saw more and more going on where uh, material or other goods coming out of China were very limited. And so in the late part of January 2020, I activated what's called our war room or command center. And what that is, is it's the top 50 people in our supply chain who would get together at 6 a.m. and at 10 p.m. on a, a daily basis. Uh, weekends included, of course, and we would compare notes, we would identify what was going on, we would um, align on best methods and which of our practices that we were going to employ from our existing playbook so that um, the 40 separate commodity teams that we were working with were all getting the benefit of um, maximum shared knowledge and ability to leverage the muscle memory we'd built over 40 years. And when I talk about that, I want to say we institutionalize what we learn with each disaster. And you know, people think disasters in supply chain are the new normal. They're the old normal. Uh, so we try to incorporate what we've learned in the past. And as a result, as a company, we had a pandemic leadership team that we had established in 2003 with SARS. Um, we didn't know when we might need it, but we knew it would be needed at some point. And so there was a, a tightly orchestrated corporate emergency response team, uh, a 50 person supply chain team that operated twice daily and uh, around the world. And um, you know, it wasn't until March 13th, I think, of 2020 that um, the US finally said, OK, it's COVID. We <laughs> don't know how long it's going to last. And um, so you know, we had several months in advance to start to put together our actions. And I think that stood us in good stead because for that year, we were still able to deliver um, to commitments at 95% on time delivery, uh, despite the many challenges that we were facing. I could go on, but we'll come back. I'll break. There's plenty more. <laughs> Catherine, you also had some early warning signs. You've got project. Bechtel has projects all over the world, mining, building, you name it. What were some of the early signs for you? And you you responded in some similar ways to Intel. I say the the first signs that we we saw, and we're an engineering construction company operating um, in all corners of the world. And the first things that we saw were the immediate health and safety um, actions for our people. These are our people on the ground our craft professionals working around the world, and ensuring the health and safety of those individuals was our first and, for, and foremost priority. And so learning how to resequence, to establish um, COVID safe protocols, to test, um, to understand the local jurisdictions, to work with our customers to ensure the health and safety of our people, that was the first thing that we had to do. And then to learn how to resequence work. How would you reduce uh, crew sizes? How would you, um, 
const do construction, physical construction in a way that protected um, health and hu human safety. So that was a huge aspect in terms of the people, the health and safety of our people. But the second thing that we saw and that we did was we buy materials. We buy, um, we buy pipe, we buy steel, we buy chemicals, we buy materials from all over the world. And understanding and having really our finger on the pulse for where are these materials coming from, what are alternative sources of supply. Um, in, in our business, the, the key, um, of course, is uh, something that's very important is certainly is pricing, but schedule is critical. Mm -hmm. And so getting materials, getting things to a site for construction on time is the name of the game. Um, and so what we started to see were needing to invoke um, these, these plans of finding alternative um, sources of supply, of looking at different modes of transportation, and ensuring that we could, we could uphold the schedule for our customers, our customers. Jennifer, for you, this came at a really interesting time. If I'm not mistaken, you had just raised a round of funding recently, bef bef right, right before that happened. You created a software that basically helps your clients monitor their supply chain and identify areas of risk and vulnerability. Right. Um, you just raised this funding. This, you know, it starts to hit the fan and you get started to get inundated with calls. Take us back to that, that time. So I think, so I think the first thing is the fact, and you both just touched on it, how sheerly just human the supply chain became. And so, you know, knock on wood, I think to your point, we had just raised our Series B. I was sharing with Catherine before this, you know, the company in terms is 17 years old. So we've been at just mapping and monitoring the global supply chain for 17 years. And yet, you know, we, so we raised this money, we were getting ready to go fast and then the world stopped. And I think to the point that you just said, the first thing was just making sure we had the health and the safety and the security of our people. But then you had massive global organizations that we had been talking to that suddenly CEOs, I was sharing with Catherine, were calling me saying, I'm still managing my supply chain on an Excel spreadsheet. What do I do? And because of the seriousness of what was going on at that time, it had started in China near the, you know, the, the implosion of bridges and the shutting down of trade routes. And there was just a lot of unknown. And so um, I shared with you when we we're getting ready for this, our inbound, so we weren't, you know, we, we were doing normal marketing, we didn't really change anything. Our inbound went up north of 400% in a matter of 30 to 60 days because every, the world stopped. Right, so it stopped from a human standpoint. People suddenly went from home. I don't know about you. I thought it was gonna be a 30 to 60 day thing. I started baking cookies for my husband, which I never bake. And then we had to stop that because it went on longer than 60 days. <laughs> but, but the world changed. And I think you know what's happened is that the world really got educated, right? The world got educated simply how hyper-connected we are in ways that we don't really know and how fragile. You know, we all went to just in time and offshoring back in the 90s, and we got really lazy. That worked, it became a kind of a cost cutting center. I agree with you. It's like, can I fulfill my orders on time? Mm -hmm. And I think the pandemic brought such a human aspect and a business bottom line that for the first time ever, the conversation is at the CEO and the board level. And I think that that's still where it is today. Catherine. Uh, you know, we, we've been through SARS, we've been through the typhoon. I mean, we see climate change and how that's changing the, the scale and the frequency of disasters. Why were we so poorly prepared? Why were so many corporations so poorly prepared? I can't, I can't certainly speak for, for, uh, for others, but I would just say that the, the ways in which um, you get prepared is to, is to practice and it is to be um, hyper focused. It's it's on the things that aren't. Um, they don't necessarily seem um, necessarily interesting, or um, there's not a lot of glory in them. But you have to do them. It is you have to embed the resilience into into the way that you do business. That's for us as a company. That's building resilience into the way we have a centralized services, whether that's payroll, IT, um, transportation, and, log and logistics, and then testing those services. Can we do this in the event of natural disaster? Can we do this in the event of geopolitical unrest? But, but really testing your systems and the resilience of your systems to respond, because it's really not a question, to Jackie's point, it's not a question of, of if these events will happen, it's a question of when they will happen, and to what degree, to what scale, where might they be? And so really you know, being, 
being being quite adamant and um, and uh, focused on on that resilience and, and and testing your systems. Jackie, we've had a lot of conversations about how long this is going to last, and we've asked everyone on everyone we talked to to look into their crystal ball to to help us understand why it's so persistent and when can we expect relief. Uh, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger recently said somewhat, to my mind, pessimistically that we're going to see this persist into 2024. Why is it going to take so much longer? Yes. Um, well, I think the big reason is that the semiconductor supply chain is very multi-level. And a lot of the limitations are not in the advanced technologies. If you look at an Intel or a Samsung or a TSMC, on their advanced technologies, they're all able to ship parts today. What's hanging things up is people can't fill out their full bill of material with a lot of the legacy technologies that were designed and equipped 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, truly old technology, fully depreciated, um, and nobody's making that equipment anymore. Um, they sell the parts at a very low price, so the return on investment um, hasn't been there for people to invest in capacity expansions over time. And behind the scenes, um, the whole world is becoming more uh, densely um, populated with semiconductors. Probably most of you have a ring doorbell or you have um, you know, a remote uh, start on your, your heater or your irrigation. Um, in so many areas of life, um, particularly automotive, there is a great densification of semiconductors. And a large part of that is from these older technologies. They're the um, power management devices or the proximity sensors. So you can see, you know, as your car is auto backing up, um, whether you're getting too close. And um, as those things became more densely used, the full capacity out in the industry was sucked up. Um, but it wasn't obvious because uh, for the automakers, these were 35 cent parts or less. It wasn't something they spent a lot of time looking at. So beneath the surface of this iceberg, we have the uh, older technologies that needed to be added to. So people say, well, why don't you build some factories? Well, it's fine, you can build a factory. It might take a year to build a factory because these are very sophisticated devices, even though it's older technology. Um, but, but once you have that building, you need equipment. Nobody's making that equipment anymore because no one has invested in that capacity for the past 30 years. So they have to restart their line. Well, why don't you buy stuff in the used market? It is sucked dry, mm -hmm. okay? And then if you're an auto manufacturer, your unification cycle for new parts is quite lengthy because they're extremely concerned about safety as they should be. So there's this um, you know, set of um, rolling requirements that have to be put in place that uh, do require that people are uh, putting their forecasts out. Um, if you're one of those guys making the 35 cent part or less, you want to know that your customers are going to uh, invest in the long term. It's not a short term blip. So there's impedance in the investment decisions. All of those things, I think, are, are starting to be worked through. Um, but you know, we need things like the CHIPS Act to uh, be passed in the United States finally. Uh, we need um, larger companies, automotive companies, uh, consumer good companies, electronics product companies to make longer term commitments to ensure that uh, the underlying providers of equipment or materials, et cetera, can feel comfortable investing in capacity. So as you can see, it's a uh, multi-level path that has taken a while to deconvolute. I think um, as we look at the beginning of 2023, you will see some improvement as uh, some new factories start to come online. But what we are obviously observing is a secular change in demand for more uh, electronically driven um, uh, products that are part of how we operate our lives. So I think you will see some tightness even through the end of the decade. Jackie, I want to come back to the CHIPS Act later. But in the meantime, Jennifer, what's your sense of when we get back to normal? Or is that the wrong way to think about it? Is a state of disruption the new normal? Well, I, so I think that this is normal. 
what we're dealing with is now. I think how we handle it has got to change, and I think that's the time. You know, we get asked all the time, how much is it going to cost? You know, it's, nothing fixes this, and I think, I love what you just went through, because I think, you know, when you talk about chips and, you know, technology, that's, I mean, the, the problem, the good and the bad here, is technology has connected us forever. We're not going back. And so how do we live in this new norm where, you know, technology's got some great advantages, right? It allows us for innovation, allows us for global cost competitiveness, access to different markets. I'm looking at the question about Mexico and Latin America. It's great opportunities because we are so connected from a technology standpoint for different parts of the world to enter the developed economy in a way they might not have had a chance. And if you think about what's happening with um, Russia, Ukraine, there's 3,000 sanctions against Russia right now. So if there are rare earth elements or any type of access to skill sets available anywhere else, people are grappling for it. And so I think this is the new normal. I think that um, you know investments in understanding the true extension of the supply chain and the good and the bad of it um, is really what's going to be happening. And I, I don't think it's going to change. I think this is exactly the, the world we're living in. To what extent, and I'm staying with you for just Please. a second, Jennifer, to what extent is our a company's, a, a, an organization, a, a corporation's preparedness for supply chain disruption, should that become a new determinant of the company's value? You know, we think about ROI, we think about there's a lot of ways we can measure the value of a company. We do that in, in myriad ways at Bloomberg. To what extent should we now have a metric for, look, can you, can your corporation, can your startup withstand this kind of disruption? Yeah, well, I think that's the name of the game. So at Enteros, and you, know, and you know this, we're working on becoming pretty much the UL for supply chain health. So we actually provide scores for companies that folks can get up that day and realize if they're going to have a good or bad day based on the health of their supply chain. We're seeing it play out in the court of public opinion. So if you think about what just happened with baby food and the stories of the mothers that went to 10, 11 stores just to look for formula, there is no brand loyalty anymore. It's about availability and be able to fulfill orders. And so I, I think when you talk about the value, the consumer is able to put val the, set the value of the business based on availability of product when they want it and in the way they want it. And so I was talking to Jackie before about ESG and sustainability. You have people that will or won't buy from your brand based on sustainable sourcing. That's all about the supply chain. And so, so that's kind of the, the B2C aspect. Then you also have the B2B where um, if you're a public company, you used to have to write a paragraph for the SEC on supply chain risk. Now, if you want to go public, they actually grade you on that. Mm. We work with PE firms that are mapping and monitoring their portfolio companies using our platform to set valuation before they even go public to set how much do they invest in them. So I think you're seeing it from a B2B standpoint. You're seeing it from a B2B. You can't escape it anymore. And the hyper-connectivity from technology is really what's enabling this. Catherine, uh, the, this crisis has, has created something of a field day for critics of the concept of globalization. So I'm curious, in your view, you know, you know, do we need to create geographically independent regions, uh, sources of supply, the question about Latin America? And, you know, um, how much do you buy the argument that, look, we went too far in terms of making our economy interdependent, our global economy interdependent from region to region? No, I don't think that it's it's uh, fair to, to say globalization didn't work, and and what we've been doing for the last you know 20 years, 30 years, you know, just isn't working. But I do think that there's there are different there are different forces on, upon us right now. There is a force of energy transition, what that means for people, what that means for companies. Um, there is a force um, that was just mentioned on the awareness of where products are made, how they are made. Um, and the importance of that. And so those things, I think, have a much stronger inf um, influence on uh, sources of supply, the awareness of where supply is coming from, and it will push us to invest you know, all, all around. It will push us to invest um, more in regional solutions. Mm -hmm. And those investing in more in regional solutions is part of, of growing the resilience of a, of a broader supply chain. So I, I think it's, a, it's absolutely a must. You know, the pendulum is, is swinging more towards certainly to increase investment, which 
by the way, you know, produces really tremendous opportunities for people, for societies, for, for employment, you know, really amazing opportunities. Um, so there is, a, there is an upside um, to this challenge. Um, but I, I, really, I think it's more in terms of the forces of energy transition, heightened awareness as to where materials are produced and how they're produced. Mm -hmm. Jackie, you mentioned the CHIPS Act. I am curious to hear from you. You know, I want to talk a little bit about what role government or governments should play in helping alleviate these kinds of crises. I think we were supposed to have the CHIPS Act through by the end of last year, and yet here we are, middle of this year. What's, what, do you, what do you see as the holdup? Can you talk about um, the sense that you're getting from D.C. on where we are and, and why things aren't happening more quickly? I love talking about politics on an open mic. This is good. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Um, I am not sure exactly what the holdup is, but um, one of the things that we do know is in our industry, uh, a lot of the competitiveness difference in terms of cost structure between um, more Western companies and those that are concentrated in Asia does come from government support, government subsidies, incentives, access to free land, preferential um, capabilities for lift and, and cargo transport and so on. And um, we do think that the uh, Western countries need to create uh, some comparable uh, support for their critical industries as well. Semiconductors is a, an important part of the United States GDP. And it is a tremendously capital intensive industry that will live with its cost structure for quite some time. And if we want to create not, you know, not fully independent regional centers, because I think that that is excessive and, and overly costly, but if we want to diversify uh, the access to resources uh, across the different region, regions for risk uh, improvement purposes, we need to somehow help level the playing field. And that playing field spans uh, cost, cost structure, incentives. It spans regulation and how um, uh, regulators and academia, for example, collaborate um, with industry. And, and we would like to see more of that attention in the United States to think about what are the critical alliances, what are the national imperatives in terms of um, research and intellectual property that would be required if we wanted to stand up a more fully robust uh, um, regional capability. And so the role that government has to play, I think, is to collaborate with industry to do things that are right for their population and to um, ensure that the things that are critical to their living standard, um, uh, which are not just products, but they're also jobs and infrastructure, that those things are um, done in tandem uh, to support the, the better good of the population. So we'd, we'd like to see that engagement, and we are finding good connections in, in DC or in the EU, and we just need to push some of these things over to the finish line. Catherine, based on what you've learned in the last couple of years, what would you say in the last few seconds, a company that is really still trying to get its arms around this, what, where do they start? Start by being humble. Um, I'd say you start by by recognizing that this is this is a challenge. Um, it is to know to know the supply chain, to know um, where to enter is going to take a, a lot of collaboration. Um, it is not um, there's not IP in terms of this collaboration, and so whether it's getting to know your suppliers, whether it's working with your customers to find the right solution, finding the right talent, um, I think that that you really need to take a step back. And, um, and be very much so approach this in terms of a one team approach. You know, what is your, what is your um, mission? What are you trying to accomplish? And then what's the super team you're going to assemble in order to make it work? Um, because no one company, no one organization is going to, to, to solve this or can approach it, but it really requires so much more coordination, um, so much more awareness to know where are all of the, pit, the bits and pieces and, and labor, where, how, do all of that, how does it all of that come together? Um, you can't know it by yourself, and you really need to collaborate. It's a great note to end on. Catherine, Jackie, and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you.